Hi, Scott. Thanks so much for joining me this morning. Oh, um, how are you? Good. I'm doing well. I've been traveling a lot, which is kind of an odd thing after like years of not now. So, so I've been, so I'm back home again, which I'm, you know, that's all great. And, uh, um, but looking forward, I always appreciate the the webinars with you. We 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 have a good time doing them together, but also hopefully Scott and I come at this. We're not clinicians. We are coming at this absolutely from a recovery standpoint. We have lots of decades of recovery between the two of us. You're getting our experience, strength, and hope. Take what you need, leave the rest. Um, uh, but we, you know, we are we are not clinically trained, but. Um, we are both passionate about recovery and want to help those that are struggling and the betrayed, you know, the loved ones that are betrayed um, as well. So, so that's the lens that we come at this from. Um, and so hopefully it's helpful for you. If you've got questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll get started. So what's your topic for today? Well, I wanted to talk about um, stress. I mean, I know this, oh. this particular webinar has always been about trauma and people who are experiencing trauma. Um, tend to experience stress related to the trauma. So I wanted to talk about stress and, and resilience, uh, how we overcome stress. Um, so if you want, I'll just jump into it. That'd be great. That's a, and okay. it's a great topic because yeah, like I always find I have less bandwidth when, if I'm stressed, it's like I have to be intentional. So please share. <laughs> and, and that's what we're gonna talk about first. Um, you know, stress manifests, whether it's trauma-based or, or just you know situationally based, um, usually it's both. Um, it manifests in a number of areas of life and it kind of reduces our ability to function. Um, so I wanted to um, talk about the 10, 10 primary areas of life in which it manifests and then we'll talk about some techniques. So the first place we see is physical health, which is, um, you know, when is the last time we went to the doctor or the dentist? Um, you know, people who are stressed tend to let things like that slip, um, can be overweight, eating poorly, not exercising, not sleeping enough, sleeping too much, um, abusing cigarettes, abusing caffeine, those are signs of stress. Um, addictions obviously are signs of stress. Um, so, so we need to pay attention to our physical health. Um, the, the, the next area is transportation. Um, I love this one. Um, if, if the engine light in your car has been on for more than a few days, um, <laughs> That may be a sign of stress and not managing your life. And by the way, it makes life seem more stressful when we don't, don't manage it. Um, if you're one of those jackrabbit start tailgate people kind of people, um, that's a sign of stress. Um, and it all, these are signs of stress and they also worsen stress. Um, if your car has fast food wrappers all over the place, you know, if it's, if it's a foot deep in trash, um, you're probably not taking very good care of yourself. Um, that's for my sister if she's listening, and she's not, but her car is always a mess. Um, you know, unpaid traffic tickets, unpaid parking tickets, um, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, or if you're a commuter, um, if you're late for the train or late for the bus all the time, it's probably a manifestation of stress in your life. Um, um, the environment, that's, this is area number three, our environment, our physical space our physical home, our space, um, same, same stuff. Um, you know, things that aren't fixed, um, we haven't done chores, the plants aren't watered, um, dirty dishes in the sink, all that. Um, if the house is a mess, um, it's probably an indicator that we're stressed out and not managing our lives very well. Um, ditto for work, if the desk, desk space is a mess, chronic lateness, if we're not returning calls, if we have an inbox on our email that's, you know, 300 things long, um, if it just feels like we have too many irons in the fire, again, uh, both the sign of stress and stress inducing. Um, fifth area, interests and hobbies. Um, you know, positive interests and hobbies provide balance in our life. Um, they give us perspective. When we don't have these things um, or when they fall by the wayside, it's usually because we're stressed um, and, and then not having that outlet makes, it, makes us more stressed. So if we're not involved with sports or exercise or reading or photography or painting or camping or fishing or, you know, volunteering or theater or whatever it is we do, if our involvement is dropping or just gone altogether, it's probably a sign that we're stressed out and it's a stress inducer because we're not releasing our tension through fun activities. Um, 
Next area is social life. Um, this is particularly for addicts. To keep our addiction secret, we isolate. Um, and betrayed partners do that too. To keep our partner's addiction secret, we isolate. Um, we start pulling away because we don't want people to know. So we stop returning phone calls. We stop returning texts, emails. Um, we start telling lies. We start keeping secrets. Um, you know, we, we pull the shades and we pretend we're not home. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Signs of stress and stress inducing. Um, you know, if we're treating our spouse or our partner uh, or other family members badly, um, you know, again, lying, keeping secrets, um, silent treatment, blaming, belittling, passive aggressive, all that kind of stuff. Signs of stress and stress inducing. So, you know, how we treat our spouse and partner and family. Um, financial chaos, another area. Um, it, you know, if the bills aren't paid or we're consistently overdrawn or we're hiding expenditures or there's, unpaid, you know, all of this stuff, if we don't have a financial cushion, um, both a sign of stress and stress inducing, um, huge credit card bills or, or, or multiple small credit card bills, um, these are things that, that are a sign that things are, are, are not going well and, and we need to take some control. Um, Spiritual life. Um, it's, it's, it's spiritual life. I almost throw in with hobbies and interests because if we're neglecting it, it's a real problem. Um, now, spiritual life doesn't mean you know church necessarily for a lot of people. It means church, but but not for everyone. Um, you know, I, I'm not a church person, but I'm a spiritual person. Um, and if I neglect my spiritual life, um, you know, if I don't take some time to commune with nature and do a gratitude list things like that, I, my life is much more stressful. It's a sign of stress. It's a cause of stress. Um, and then uh, addictions, compulsivities, um, another you know, obvious signs of stress right there. Um, addictions are about alleviating stress and other forms of emotional discomfort. Um, so if I'm engaging in an ad addictive activity, um, my life is not going well, and I'm using that addiction to, to numb out and zone out and not deal with it. Um, so all of these signs of stress are basically, I think, I think most of you may have sensed a theme is I'm not dealing with life. I'm not participating in life. I shut it down. My life gets messy. Um, I just stop taking care of things. Um, and this occurs whether we're an addict or whether we're a betrayed partner. And addiction itself is highly, highly stressful. Um, <clears throat> So we need to build resilience to stress. Our life gets out of control. And again, this goes for every person on the planet, not just addicts, not just betrayed partners, not just loved ones of addicts. Um, and these, this, this list that I'm about to give you um, comes from David Fawcett. Um, his, his techniques for addressing stress, um, he gives five of them. Do not wait for happiness. Um, this is particularly good for addicts. Addicts feel they're undeserving of happiness, even when they get in recovery, um, because they've screwed up so bad with their addiction that, that they don't deserve to be happy. Um, plus, there's some changes in the brain that, that cause what we call anhedonia, which make it hard to experience enjoyment. Um, but as the brain heals, uh, it reboots, uh, we get back to normal, and it's easier to experience pleasure. <coughs> but in the interim and, uh, and all through recovery, we need to promote happiness in our lives as both addicts and both as, and, and loved ones of addicts. Um, it's really important that we enjoy ourselves. So this goes back to hobbies and social life and how we treat our family and friends, things like that, spiritual life. Um, we need to actively seek out happiness. Um, this next one is my favorite, face challenges directly. Um, I've written about obstacle immunity on our website a couple of times. Um, you know, our dysfunctional coping patterns are, are, are avoidance. We see an obstacle and we either stop and make a nest <laughs> in front of the obstacle and just stare at the obstacle, or we like walk around it, which takes three weeks, um, when it was, you know, or, or whatever. I mean, you know, the my mother had the the low air tire light on in her car for weeks and weeks and weeks and she was calling me every day to complain about you know her just something wrong with her tire 
<laughs> for weeks. And, and I, every day I said, go to the dealer. It's right down the street. They'll put some air in it for you. She's 81. Um, you know, she plays the old lady card. They'll fix it for her. They won't even charge. Weeks and weeks and weeks. And then finally, she didn't call me about the, the, the tire anymore. And I realized that she had gotten the tire fixed. Um, you know, addicts and betrayed partners, we just sweep it under the rug and pretend it's not there. Um, we need to face our challenges. And I blew. It's my cat blew. Um, <laughs> and um, when we face our challenges and start overcoming them, we develop what we call obstacle immunity. And it becomes easy to face challenges. Now, you know, I, in my addiction, I drove around with the check engine light on for two years, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now the check engine light comes on and I, I go get it fixed, whatever it is right away. And it's now that I know how to overcome life's little obstacles, it's easy, but we have to practice it. So face our challenges directly, develop some obstacle immunity. Um, the third one David has, has is um, use a self-initiated pep talk. Um, you know, we have to motivate ourselves. Um, our own internal critical thinking will undermine our confidence and our competence. Um, so we have to replace those old beliefs with new ones. And, and that can take the form of affirmations. I am capable of handling this. I am handling this. You know, I will handle this today. Um, we have to give ourselves that pep talk. <clears throat> um, number four comes from that, be an optimist. Um, past traumas, the onset of addiction, consequences of addiction, um, they can all lead us to a belief that, you know, our life is just crap. And, and no matter what we do, things are gonna fall apart. And that's just not true. Um, but it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, that, that's true for addicts, it's true for loved ones, it's true for anybody. If we have this negativity bias, like things are going to turn out poorly for me, they're going to turn out poorly for me. So we need to, to be optimistic um, to, to combat you know, our stress. Um, and the last one is staying in the here and now. Um, my favorite new word is, is um, disasterbation. Um, I saw that, so, yeah. <laughs> You know, and it's living in the wreckage of the future, which may or may not ever come to pass. I am the king of living in the wreckage of the future. I don't tend to live in the wreckage of my past, which is also not productive. Um, I tend to, you know, I can go from zero to homeless in about three seconds flat. You know, somebody looks at me cross-eyed and, you know, you think a nuclear bomb just went off because that's what happens in my head. Um, so the new word for this is disasterbation where we just sit and ruminate about all the things in our life that are gonna go wrong. And, and it's, it's not helpful. We need to stay in the here and now. So we need to do some grounding. Um, you know, one of my, my friends in early recovery, uh, who I'm still very good friends with, always looks at me and says, where are your feet? Um, and he's like, what he's saying is, where are you right now? What are you doing right now? And I, you know, every time he says that, I look down at my feet and go, oh yeah, I'm, I'm in my office, I'm giving a webinar. Um, I need to pay attention to what I'm doing right now um, instead of worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow or a week from now or 12 years from now or, or whatever. So when we can do these things, um, you know, we live more consciously. Um, you know, we, we're more present with, with ourselves. We're more present with other people. Um, we can overcome our shame. Shame is what drives addicts for sure. Um, and a lot of partners of addicts also experience a lot of shame. We have these shame-based <coughs> shame based beliefs. I'm not good enough. I can never be successful. No one will ever love me. No one will ever accept me as I am. So that drives us to secret keeping and, and lies and covering up and just this negativity bias, like everything will go bad and then things do go bad. Um, we also become interestingly more empathetic. Um, when we're overcoming obstacles, when we're living in the moment, when we're doing these things that we need to do, we actually become more empathetic, which is really important for addicts. Addicts, if you want to develop empathy for your betrayed partner, um, yes, you could, there are things you can do to develop empathy, like I sense your feelings, miss. Can you tell me if I'm right? 
if I'm not right, can you explain what you are feeling? I want to I want to be on the same page with you. That's an empathy exercise. But if if you want to really really develop empathy, work on you know don't wait for happiness. Face your challenges. Give yourself a pep talk. Be an optimist and stay grounded. Stay in the here and now. That will help you with empathy. Believe it or not, they seem unrelated. They're not. Um, this is a big one for all of us, healthy self-care. Um, you know, the first thing we talked about with stress is a lack of self-care. And basically everything that we talked about about how stress manifests is a lack of self-care. Um, we take care of ourselves. We start taking care of the environment around us. Things look better. We become more optimistic. You know, if my car is not a foot deep in trash with a check engine light and a low, low tire, um, I'm not going to get depressed every time I get in my car. You know, I'm just going to know that I'm going to I'm going to be optimistic that my car will get me from point A to point B. This is really important. If you know, if I'm eating healthier and getting enough sleep, I feel better. It's easier to be optimistic. It's easier to to just participate in life. Um, so, so healthy self care. Part of that is increasing our social connection. Um, we become as we become more comfortable in our own skin. By doing these things, we become more comfortable with other people. When we're stressed out, it's hard to feel comfortable in our own skin and our own life. Um, we think that everybody else is judging us. You know, there's a lot of anxiety involved. As we get our things under control, as we face and overcome our obstacles, we become more comfortable in our own skin and, and we can interact with others more, which again helps with every aspect of recovery, including empathy. Um, and the, and the last one, um, we tend to find our purpose. Um, you know, I, I call it True North. I've written about True North on the website, too, if you want to look that up. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be some big purpose, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to heal the world of, I'm going to heal every person on earth of addiction. I mean, that it, that's a nice goal, but it, it's not realistic. We just find our purpose, you know. And sometimes our purpose is to be the best spouse and parent that we can be. Um, sometimes it's, you know, um, to run a marathon, you know, we can have multiple purposes. But we tend to find a purpose once we clear out the clutter in our lives. Stress is clutter. Um, when we clear that out, we can figure out what we want to do with our life. And, and we've developed the ability to overcome the obstacles so we can actually get there. Uh, and be the people that we want to be. Um, that was a very quick run through stress and resilience. I feel like I was talking at uh, Dr. Rob's speed, which means fast. Uh, but um, Tammy, any thoughts or? or so I have lots of thoughts, and you know, like it's interesting because you, when we get these things under control, and I think my stress is correlated to my trying to control, and so like. I have to be intentional about what am I doing now? And, you know, not, you know, disasterbation is a, a great term. I love that term. And, you know, but, but, you know, it's really easy for me to, um, to get into the, like, I've had a lot going on and everything was out of my control. The schedules last week, I changed my flight. I'm not exaggerating six times trying to navigate, you know, how these things were all going to that's stressful, you know, I mean, it's just as stressful. And so I have no control over anything else. You know, what do I have control over? I find for me that I clean if I'm, if I'm hyper-focused on cleaning and I know what it is. I mean, I, it's a positive way of like, but I'm like, I can control this and I can make this look better. And that, that makes me feel better. So for me, cleaning is actually taking control in one area, but I feel better, you know, and, and, um, uh, you know, like I, I want things, you know, I, I, I value cars. I really like, you know, I, I like having, you know, red cars that kind of go fast, you know, but anyway, but I want them to look nice. You know, I'm the only <laughs> woman the in the neighborhood. That goes fast. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm the only woman in the neighborhood that's out washing my own car, you know, like, and I'm okay with that, you know, but I'm grateful my dad taught me how to do that, you know, so, I mean, like all of those things, in fact, every time I wash my car, I think of my dad and thank you, dad, for teaching me how to wash a car, you know, like, I mean, it's just one of those things where the gratitude, but also staying in the now, I love that you tied it into connection, you know, you're talking to somebody who will help you 
stay grounded in the moment, you know, because, you know, this is the scary place and having someone having those connections with other people, you know, helps us, you know, do life differently. So, so we, we, you know, we have choices. I think the personal, um, you know, the personal care is something that people, you know, it's really quick to let go of, you know, like, what do I need? To, I need to eat healthy. I need to exercise. I need to take care of me. I need to do my spiritual. I have my little apps on my phone that, you know, in the morning I do my, I do my meditation so that, you know, and I, I have, you know, I missed a day when I was traveling, like, you know, about a month ago and I had this nice long streak because I'm motivated by, you know, like how many days, you know, and I had over 400 days consecutive. And then I was like, what I'm at day one. And I realized that the day before I missed, you know, so now I have a reminder just to check in, you know, to make sure that I do that in case I miss and I haven't again, but, but like it, you know, it's meaningful to me. And in the, in the chaos that I was in, in the moment, I missed it and I'm, I missed out, you know, so, so, um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I mean, I thank you for the, those of you joining. This is, this is self-care. I'm doing something that is good. It's nurturing. It's helpful. It's, you know, it's, it, I'm taking time out of a, a probably busy day to, to be here and, and to connect with something that's a, you know, a positive thing. So, um, uh, you know, the hungry, angry, lonely, tired, I added stressed to that. I know when I'm stressed, I have less bandwidth. I have less tolerance. You know, I, I am more reactive and, and, and I know it. So the more I can do to help, you know, assuage that to make it be okay. I'm more grounded. I'm doing what I need to do for self-care. I'm connecting with people. I'm keeping focused on what, what is really meaningful life. It's the connections with other people, you know? If I, you know, don't, don't get the laundry done in a timely manner, not the end of the world, but it's on my list. Um, it's, so I, I is for me, it's really the challenge of like, I don't want too much clutter, but I also, do, I don't need to be so compulsive about things. So, so where do I find that balance of I'm taking care, I'm taking enough care, but I'm not missing the point of life because I'm so focused on cleaning, you know, so it, it, and it's a learning experience, you know, the, the, I'm always swinging through the pendulum, you know, so, so, but more hours of more days I live in the, you know, in that middle part, I'm not, you know, on the extremes anymore, which is only a gift of recovery. Yeah, yeah I like um, one of the first things you mentioned was sometimes we can't control stressful situations. I mean, a lot of our stress, um, is internally generated from shame, from trauma, from things like that. But you know, travel stress. I mean, we have no control over yeah. travel stress. Um, and and one of the tools that's useful is the serenity prayer. You know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, which is the fact that the airlines are screwing me up right now. Um, the courage to change the things I can, which is my attitude about it. And you know, and I can change from this flight to that flight. That's what I. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the wisdom to know the difference and. External stress, I, I find the serenity prayer is, is very helpful. Um, you know, internal stress, um, I find things like, you know, five, four, three, two, one grounding, like um, five things I see, four things I hear, three things I smell, taste, touch. And just go down the list. It's just like a wear your feet exercise. I find that helpful. I find uh, breath work helpful. You know, breathe in for four, hold for seven, breathe out for eight, mm -hmm. uh, do that. It, it, this, Studies show if you do that three times, your blood pressure will actually drop. Um, kind of amazing. Um, so now when I go to the doctor, I do that real quick before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I probably shouldn't do because they're not getting a, a great reading. But I also find my mm -hmm. gratitude list really helpful. Um, I'm a big gratitude guy. Um, you know, I have a morning routine that involves, um, you know, a gratitude list. And, and if I forget to do it, I will usually catch myself somewhere right about now, usually about 10 a.m. I'll realize that I'm frazzled, I'm stressed. And it's because I didn't take the time in the morning to calm down and ground myself and remember that, you know, my life is actually pretty good. Um, you know, you know, some days I wake up on the wrong side of the bed and I really need to do that. Some days I wake up on the right side of the bed and I still need to do it um, to stay there. So, yeah. 
Well, and you bring up a like the things that work for us, we need to keep doing them. And addicts are really good at, you know, oh, that worked and now I'm better and now I don't need to do that again. And then all of a sudden everything is chaotic and it's like, what happened? And it's like, because we quit doing the things that actually really work for us. So, so, you know, and, and everybody finds the, I love the serenity prayer. That actually is my mantra. And, you know, you talked about it too, you know, you know, you're, you're, uh, uh, aging mother, you know, I mean, like family, families are messy, you know, and, you know, and it's, it's like, and that's, you know, a lot of, you know, what I've been dealing with too, is like the, you know, the stuff and I have no control over any of those things. And there's more people looking for, you know, I, th that I need to step in and help in some way. And so, so there's more, on my plate right now so then it's like what do I need to let go of you know, in order to have the bandwidth to be able to step into that space you know I have to make a conscious decision to to, you know, to look at those things but I have no control over you know my parent I mean I have no control over anybody else I just have control over my actions and reactions and I can be intentional but but, but I was I was visiting my parents. Um, this is part of my travel thing. And, you know, like there, there was a conversation and it was going, uh, you know, a little sideways. My, my dad is struggling. And, um, and I just was like, oh, I just need to back right off right now. Cause I knew like, you know, just going in was going to go nowhere and it was just going to stress him out and be, it wasn't going to be good. And so, so I, like being able to be pay attention to not what do I need? I need him to do this thing and whatever. No, it's like, I need to back off and give him the grace, you know, so, and give him some space and, and we'll see what happens, you know? So, but it's uh, lots of challenges. So that's the beautiful yeah. thing about the serenity prayer is, you know, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, which is all of you <laughs> mm -hmm. and all of your behaviors and thoughts, mm -hmm. the courage to change the things I can, which is me, my behaviors and thoughts. And the wisdom to know the difference. And yep. I need that reminder at least three times a day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and 30. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no control over and, and, and I hate that. <laughs> I have no control over anybody or anything. And you know, my best laid plans and I'm busy and I'm laying things out. And if everybody if everybody follows the plan, we're good. And and, and it doesn't work that way. And so my serenity can be tied to that in a negative way if I don't reframe. So, so first question, hello, I'm SA in recovery. Great, because my recovery is going well. I'm no longer constantly stressed out or struggling. Unfortunately, my spouse gets triggered. I appear too comfortable. How can I communicate to my spouse that I'm not thinking about acting out 24 um, seven? That's a really good question. Um, you want to take it first or you want me to? No, please. Yeah, please. Cause I'm going like, like I'm going, I've been in recovery a long time and I still get stressed out. So, but like, but I hear that you're not stressed out about the, about the actual acting out. So, which is great, you know, and that's the freedom that comes with recovery. I, but I was like, oh, but I just convert it to other things that I get stressed out about. <laughs> so, so, so let's, let's just back up a second. So um, when this is from a male, so I'm going to assume that the spouse is, is, is female, and, and I apologize if I'm getting it wrong. But when you tell your wife, or when your wife finds out that you've been acting out, this is something you have known about for the whole time you were doing it, which right. is often, you know, months, years, decades. Um, your, your, your wife finds out, and it's a shock. She just got hit by a Mack truck with mm -hmm. information that it is incredibly painful and her whole world has been flipped upside down. Um, everything you've ever said and done in your entire life is now in question <laughs> because if you were lying about something it's so important uh, as relationship infidelity, if you were keeping it secret and lying about it, she can no longer trust anything you've ever said or done. So that is where she is. <laughs> um, so it is going to take a while for her to get from, I no longer trust anything you say or do or that you've ever said or done back to being comfortable with you just sitting on the couch watching TV. It's going to take a year or more. Um, so you need to resign yourself to the fact that you've got 
at least a full year of this roller coaster ride. Um, you know, where you're going to be questioned. Um, and you've earned it. I'm sorry, you've earned it. <laughs> just just deal with that. Now, when you're not struggling and she, she's triggered because you look look too relaxed, too comfortable, um, you know, all you can say is, you know, I actually am really comfortable right now. I'm feeling pretty good. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling solidly sober right now. Um, but yes, my guard is still up just in case. Um, and, you know, I've been sober from this addiction since 2002. My guard is still up just in case because um, particularly with sex addiction, there's no way we can walk through life and not get triggered. Um, a billboard, a person, uh, you know, somebody says something, a smell sometimes. Um, all these things can trigger us. And, and a lot of times it's out of the blue. So we, we, you know, for the rest of our lives, we have to be slightly on guard. Um, so, but yeah, there are moments for me where I'm not thinking about my addiction at all because it's just the furthest thing from my mind. And I love those moments. They're great. Um, and I encourage you to love those moments and enjoy them, but also understand that your spouse isn't caught up to you yet. It's going to take her a while to catch up to your comfort level. Um, and, and, and that's the normal process um, because, you know, usually when you get in recovery, you're relieved. Um, you're like, oh, thank God. Now I can finally do something about this super stressful behavior. Um, and, and then when it starts to work, it's great. Um, still, keep your guard up. Um, but um, your spouse is lagging behind you in the comfort scale. And all you can do is say, you know what, I am feeling comfortable right now. Um, I'm, you know, but I understand why you might still not be feeling comfortable. Um, I caused that. Tammy. Yeah, and I think I think it really is. It, it, how do you communicate? It's your actions. It, it is how are you showing that you are doing what you need to do to take care of it, so that your guard is up. You know, how, how transparent are you with your, you know, with your twelve step? How tr how transparent are you with your? I mean, it's not like you tell everything that you talk about at your therapist, but like, does your um, does your spouse know that you're you know seeing your qualified therapist every week? You know, they, I mean, but it really is. And and Dr. Rob wrote in out of the doghouse. It's your actions. It's it, it, what are you doing if you're showing up truthfully? You know, um, that's how it starts to help the partner change, uh, change their triggers is because now they're seeing, okay, I'm starting to see that he is, he or she is actually doing what they're saying they're doing. Their words and actions are in alignment. They're congruent. They're not, you know, they're not compartmentalized and, and dissociated and all of that. So, so it really is actions. Um, you're showing up here. That's great. Um, you're asking questions. That's great. Um, and, and the struggles are different, you know, the, so struggling with the acting out is, is one thing. And yes, the freedom from not struggling with that on a, you know, 24 seven basis is a huge relief, but, but, but then there's life, you know, and, and the reason we acted out was because we didn't do life well. So, so now we're dealing with the struggles of life and we still have to have a plan and we have to use the tools that we learn in recovery on life. Because otherwise, we're going to go right back to acting out in one form or another. Yeah. So, Tammy, th this kind of brings up a part of your answer. Brings up another question: How transparent do I need to be about my recovery? How much should my betrayed partner know about what I'm doing, and and how much is my private recovery? I think they should know. Like, like if I'm going to a twelve step you know, my husband knows I'm going to a 12 step. If I'm, you know, if whatever I'm doing, like where I'm going, what I'm doing, they need to know. I never share, you know, what, you know, who I hear here, what I see here, what let it stay. I mean, what I say here, let it stay here. So I'm not telling what that now I can say, you know, I mean, I've had, you know, people, you know, that, that have celebrated a major milestone. And so I can say, I had a friend in 12 step and they got a chip, you know, and, you know, and that's about as much as I will say about it. Or, you know, it was a particularly, you know, interesting topic to me today, 
you know, and sometimes I'll share the topic again, not sharing any details of that, but it's about my experience with that. But, but I don't tell anything about, you know, who I'm seeing in meetings, what I'm saying in meetings, you know, in therapy, if there, if it's a safe thing for me to share and an insight um, that isn't going to be triggering for my partner, um, that isn't going to be problematic, um, you know, I, you know, I, I mean, I think it, you know, I, I think it's okay to share certain things that are helpful for me um, uh, to share, but I have to always have the gauge of, is it safe for me to share it to my partner? Is it appropriate to take out of something else? But it isn't like here, you know, I, I just heard about someone was um, uh, doing a Zoom um, uh, with their therapist and the partner was listening in. And I'm like, how can I know how can I know how can the the client be honest and truthful with the therapist and really dig into things when the partner is listening and I know the partner is looking for safety I know they're looking for them to show up but they're they're same with the partner the partner should have their own support where they have safety to be able to share how they're truly feeling that's how we make progress is dealing with the mucky stuff you know so there has to be safety for that what are your thoughts yeah, I, I agree. Um, I always encourage guys, you know, your partner should know your schedule. <laughs> you know, I'm going mm -hmm. to this meeting now and this meeting then and this meeting then. And I have therapy here and I have group therapy here and I do my work group there. But my work group assignments and my therapy assignments are my work group assignments and my therapy assignments there for me. Um, and and I, I don't encourage the guys I work with to share those with, with their partners um, because it tends to be really, really triggering for the partner. Um, when it's time for full disclosure, that information is synthesized and, and put into a, a presentable fashion and, and, and a proper order and everything all at once. There's a reason to do it that way. You know, therapy assignments tend to be piecemeal. Um, and a lot of times addicts don't even fully understand their answers or, or they're still not being fully truthful. It's, uh, yes, I know you want attention. Um, so yeah, I mean, your work of therapy is yours, but the fact that you're doing the work should be shared. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I agree with that. And and I know it's so tempting for partners to go look for the homework. And I know some addicts have left it out, you know, too conspicuously. So so safeguarding yeah, for partners, I know looking for safety, but on the other hand, it's like this is more traumatizing for you to not get the information in a in a safe way. So as tempting as it is, I I urge you to safeguard you by not, you know, digging into that, um, uh, you know, sp specifically. So, okay, next question. Do we know an app for tracking feelings? And I, I don't know a specific app for tracking feelings. I'm sure there is one. Um, I use more mindfulness things. I, I um, oh, oh, there, the feelings wheel. There you yeah, go, it's the in feelings the chat. Wheel which I think is useful for yeah. people on track, but it's highly useful. Yeah, yeah, my current one, of, I've got two meditations I do in the morning, but one of them is the miracles of recovery. So Harriet Hunter, who did the journaling um, webinar on our site, and it, it was so interesting, but there's research about how valid um, journaling is, but her journaling became miracles of recovery, which has won awards. So it, it, and then I've got it, you know, downloaded. And, and so I follow through it's short, but it's like, it's, it's meaningful. And, you know, whether you're in recovery or not, you know, I still think it would be useful stuff, but particularly if you're, you know, if you're the addict who's working on recovery, you know, like I find it super helpful. So, um, okay. I, I wanted to, uh, before I forget to, you mentioned work group. So that's a different term. And so let me share with people what those are. We have a sex addiction 101 level one starting tonight. Um, so this is Wednesday, November 3rd. If you're watching the video, we have them starting, you know, about once a month, but, but this is a structured live facilitated. Scott does some, um, you know, we have several facilitators that are, uh, are guiding through 
uh, the Sex Addiction 101 workbook over six weeks, 90 minutes a, a week. Um, and there's homework assigned and it's really a good foundation. We call it the psychoeducation. So it's not therapy, it's not treatment, it's not 12 step, you know, it's very different, but those are online via Zoom. Low cost is $350 for six weeks. Um, we have a porn addiction 101, which will start again in January. Those are on the seekingintegrity.com site, but it, we call them work groups because they're different than a workshop and it's not therapy or treatment. Um, so, um, and we have a couples one that will start again in um, a couples healing from betrayal work group that will start again in January. A little different, those are two hours, but, but check out the work groups because they're a very specific thing that in conjunction with other things that you're doing, it's not enough, like on, on its own, like thinking that you can do 90 minutes a week and, you know, poof, you'll magically be changed. It isn't, but it is a really good component to help, um, you know, people get a, you know, get a foundation. And, and with the couples, it's like, how do we communicate? How do we grieve losses together? What it would ha healthy sexuality even be for us? I mean, all of those things are, you know, challenging, you know, and to, to work through. So, so check those all out. Um, any questions, as always, email me. Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. So you can find the work groups on the seekingintegrity.com site, not the right. sex relationship healing site. Yes. Um, so you have to go to seekingintegrity.com for those. Yes. And they toggle between the two, but yes, the seeking integrity has, you know, the support uh, sessions. We've got 25 and 50 minute support sessions. Again, not therapy or treatment, but they can be super helpful. There's information about the expert consultations which are a paid thing with Dr. Rob and Dr. David. Um, it, the information about our 14, 21 or 28 day treatment program is on there, but you know, email me or call me if you have questions on that. Um, and then all the resources on sex and relationship healing.com, including the webinar that you're on now, um, the drop-in groups, we've got lots of different drop-in groups and we're adding more. Um, uh, uh, all of those are on the sex and relationship healing.com site. Oh, and the podcasts are, are on there too. So, okay. Next question. Yesterday I got stressed because I saw a blocked call on my phone from a few days before from my former partner who I haven't seen or spoken to in over a year as a betrayed, I have different feelings about this, anger, disgust and sadness, worried. Now my focus is back on him and I have to focus on me and my recovery. That's why I blocked him. Any suggestions? Great for you to share it here. Honestly, that's a, that's a start. So, you know. Yeah, the most important thing um, is to get it out of your head. Um, when I have any kind of a trigger or any kind of a thing that's living up here and taking up too much space, um, I take it to a meeting and I share it. Um, sorry, my neighbor is moving and he's um, <laughs> got a bin out there. It's all good. Noise. Um, so yeah, you got to get it out of your head. If you if you let it sit in your head, uh, it's going to take over. Um, and you know, a lot of the things we talked about earlier, like grounding exercises and gratitude lists and turning it over to your higher power in the serenity prayer, um, things like that. And by the way, um, great job for blocking somebody who's unhealthy for you. Um, that is one of the things that people don't do. Well, I still care about him or her. And I, what if they need some, you know, it is not your problem anymore. <laughs> um, that person's problems are that person's problems. And you, um, you know you need to focus on your recovery. You say so in the question. I'm so glad that you recognize what's, what's most important right now, which is taking care of yourself um, and, and getting this out. Um, yeah, as far as specific suggestions, um, keep them blocked or her or whoever it is, keep them blocked. Um, don't respond. Um, make sure your support network knows that this is in my head right now and I'm committing to you. You know, I would call Tammy and say, hey, Tammy, my ex, you know, I saw a call from my ex that was blocked, but it's still in the log and it's triggering me. I'm just committing to you that I am not going to call him. Um, and, you know, I will check back in with you tomorrow to make sure, you know, I didn't call him. And then I might, I might check in. I might send her a text every day for a week. To make sure I didn't call my ex, you know. I mean, you may want to do that. And here's this. This is one of those that I hate, but it actually works. 
um, about the feelings because the anger, the disgust, the sadness, the worried, I, I have to let that go. And, and this, like I said, the, take what you need and leave the rest. This was really hard for me, but someone shared early in my recovery, you're letting that person live rent free in your head. I was really at, I got angry about that. I was like, no, you don't understand. No, they were like, you're giving them space. So I was like, what do I do? And I had to commit to um, wishing them, you know, praying if that's just something you do, but yeah, um, but wishing them good, hoping that they have good things come into their life. And, um, and, and I've unfortunately had to do this with a number of of situations and people you know, over the years. In fact, a couple of years ago, I had one that was getting really stuck in my head and I had to do it again. And, and I, I hate having to do it, you know, cause I just hate having to do that, but I hate worse having it be stuck in my head. And so I'm willing to do that and, and I can do it kind of grudgingly at first, but man, I'll tell you, you know, it, it actually works. So like the, the people, the people that I've, you know, ended up praying good things happen. They have no control over my head anymore. And so, um, it, it, I realized it was the freedom for me to wish them good. And so it's just a suggestion. Yeah. 2019 was my year of old resentments. Um, I, I had resentments from when I was in middle school, literally that I was <laughs> carrying around uh, in my 50s and I would take them out like Gollum with the ring and play with them and you know like like turn them into this big fantasy thing where I'm getting even and I, I said this and said you know I'm like really these people were taking up space in my life and I hadn't seen them in 35 years yeah um, so I finally did this exercise where I, I just had the whole list of them and I did one at a time and I would pray for them in the morning and the evening to have all the good things in life that I would want for myself. And I did that for 30 days. And the first week um, I get more resentful because I'm having to pray for these people that I, I don't like now. I never liked, you know, blah, blah, blah. But by the end of the month, it's gone. Um, and then I get to move on to the, and I spent a whole year getting rid of ancient resentments. Um, you know, and they were just, they were under my skin. They were impacting my life negatively and they had no right to do that. Um, so as soon as I stopped sharing, you started talking and I started wanting, I wanted to go, oh, and pray for them. Um, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, it works. We don't have to like it, but we can, if, if yeah. we want the freedom from those resentments, it works. Yeah. So yeah, the first week or 10 days, it's super annoying that we're praying for these people that we're so pissed at, but yes. it, it, it goes away. And then, then the resentment goes away and, and their ability to control us from afar goes away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, of course I can still think of the names and, you know, but like, I don't, I don't have this nausea in my stomach thinking about, you know, people. And, and I, I have to remember that everybody's just human and you know, and so, some of us are more, you know, broken than others. I'm by, you know, I mean, I'm on the list, you know, so I'm, I am confident that I have caused resentments, you know, for other people as well. And so, you know, at some point I have to just remember part of the human race and we're flawed and we're doing the best we can. So, yeah. okay. Next question. I'm the betrayed wife and have been married for 32 years. The second D-Day was August of 2020. My husband is now owning his addiction and working on recovery. Why? <laughs> this is a great. Why does the addict lie? My husband doesn't have a good understanding of why he has lied so much. I'm, I'm trying not to laugh, but I mean, why does the, why does the addict lie? Because it's an addict. Um, you know, it's what addicts do. Um, and we're not being cavalier about no. this. It, I mean, our clinical director says, tell the truth and tell it faster. And that's, uh, it, you know, that's at Seeking that's Integrity, that's just about everything. It isn't just about your, it isn't just about your addiction. It's about, you know, it's about everything. Dr. Rob talks about it in Out of the Doghouse. If you say you're going to take out the trash and you don't take out the trash, and you say you did take out the trash, that you lied about it. You you need to go say, you know, Scott, I told you I was gonna take out the trash. I told you I, I did, I didn't do it. I'm telling you now, I was afraid that you would be mad at me or think I was a failure. And so like, you know, yeah. but now I'm gonna do it, you know, whatever. But it's, it, it we lie about, we lie to ourselves. So please understand, we lie to ourselves 
as much as we lie to everybody else. So, um, uh, more, but- more, more, more specifically though, to the question, why do addicts lie? Addicts are, addiction is an escape from the world. Um, and the reason we escape from the world through a substance or a behavior rather than by calling somebody who might, who loves us and might actually support us and help us get, help us get our needs met is we're shame-based, usually because we have trauma. Um, you know, we learn early in our lives that if I go to my mother or my father, you know, my father's a brick wall, my mother is really inconsistent and is as likely to scream at me for something that's not my fault or scream at the neighbor for something that's not their fault or scream at a school administrator for something that's not there as she is to help. Um, as a matter of fact, she's more likely to, to do that. So I learned early in my life, don't go to mom because craziness will happen and don't go to dad because, you know, he'll just like look at me like... I'm not there. And I mean, lovely people. I love my parents, but you know, they were not able to meet my, they were not able to meet my emotional needs as a kid. So I, you know, as a kid, I internalized that. That's what children do. It's all about me. Um, I thought there must be something wrong with me. And then if I reach out to anyone ever, I'm going to be met with either a stone wall or craziness. So I stopped reaching out to people. And I started numbing out instead of trying to get my needs met by drinking or masturbating or you know doing drugs or, or whatever I was doing at, at various ages. Um, and but I was also knew that I was not supposed to be doing those things, and I felt shame about them. And so I started covering them up, and I started living a double life. And I had compartments: alcohol, drugs, sex, school, sports you know, smiling at people, you know, and pretending everything's okay. I had like these little boxes and I would open up whichever box was pertinent at the time. And I would lie and keep secrets about the other boxes. And I was lying, as Tammy pointed out, we lie to ourselves first and then we start lying to other people. Um, but we believe our own lies because we tell them so often and we don't have any reality checks. Um, because we're not reaching out to other people. So my BS sounds rational to me. Um, and then I start expecting you to believe it. Um, and, and by the way, secrets are another form of lying. Um, you know, if I'm withholding important information, it's, it's the same as a lie, um, especially from a betrayed partner's perspective. If I should know this and you're not telling me, you're lying to me. Um, so we, we lie to protect ourselves because we're shame-based about who we are. And then we lie to protect our coping mechanism, which is our addiction. It's the one thing that sort of helps us feel better um, when, we're, when we're feeling shame or, or loneliness or depression or whatever. Um, it doesn't actually make us feel better. It just makes us feel less. Um, you know, addict, addictions are not about feeling good. They're about feeling less. Um, <laughs> sorry in the comments feature. Um, you know, uh, and, and this is why we do it. We want to protect ourselves and we want to protect the coping mechanism. If you know about my drinking or my drugging or my cheating or my porn use or whatever, you'll, you'll try to intervene. And I don't want that. So, so I lie. And over the years, I just lie. I mean, I become really a really good liar. And I lie. I start lying for no reason. It's, it's not compulsive but it's a habit and it's a hard habit to break. Um, I've talked about this on other webinars. I think I've talked about it with Tammy. You know, I would, you know, I would be six months into recovery. I'd be in a 12 step meeting and I, something would come out of my mouth and I'd be like, Oh my God, that's not true. And I, 15 seconds later, I would say that thing I said 15 seconds ago was not true. I would have to, you know, amend it in the 12 step. meeting. Why was I lying? You know, no point to these lies and they were coming out of my mouth anyway because it was such a hard habit to break um you know i'm somebody that I, uh, a friend of mine in recovery here um he, when he was a teenager uh he made up a story you know about his girlfriend in canada you know and they had sex and you know whatever and because he lived on the canadian border well it actually wasn't that far fetched but yeah um, he, in recovery, like five years in recovery, he was with a group of guys and they were talking about their first sexual experience and he automatically told this lie from when he was like 14 years old um, that he had been 
And he was like, oh my God, that's not true. <laughs> you know, at, at, at like age 40, he realized, oh my God, that's not true. And he had to amend it and say, whoa. <laughs> so somebody put in the chat feature, no point to these lies. That will be on my gym study. I totally get it. Tim, thoughts? Well, no, I do, you know, I do, but, but here's what I hear in recovery. We learned to do it differently in a, in a recovery meeting, you owned that you, you know, that I just told a lie, you know, and, and it's a safe place to do it. I hear, unfortunately, too often of the people that are going to their therapist and they're lying to their therapist and, and, and I hate it. I, first of all, they're not getting any benefit out of it. it. They still know they're lying on some level, but the partners are going, he's going to his therapist. He's working really hard, you know, so they're getting the kudos for I'm trying. I know people, we've had people that have come to treatment that are, you know, picking up chips for periods of time that they don't, they haven't earned, you know, so, so all of that is a lie. And, and unfortunately, if we live in those lies that continues to erode our self-esteem, we know we're liars. We know that if people actually knew who we were, they wouldn't like us. So it, it keeps us distance. So the more we step into the truth, we believe that. That's, that's what our brain is. Telling. Yes. Yeah. Be, well, because we're, we're not giving them a chance because we're not yeah. telling the truth, you know, so we, we keep this facade and we keep people pushed away. Um, uh, you know, if you, you just, just look over here, you know, this is, this is who I am. No, it's not, you know, and so you're right. It, it's, we believe that, but we don't give them a chance because we're still lying. Yeah. So it, it is the hard stuff to break, but, you know, in the treat, you know, we just say, tell the truth and tell it faster 24 hours to come back and and say it and hopefully you know i know the first few times it'll be at 23 hours 59 minutes but hopefully it's like you know 15 seconds ago what i just said that's that's a lie you know and i'm sorry you know i and i'm sorry doesn't cut it i'm sorry i'm going to change i'm i did not mean to hurt you but i was afraid of your reaction i whatever it's just a it's a terrible habit working and breaking you know what whatever but just saying i'm sorry it's always about action so uh, lip service if it's just i'm sorry so breaking the habit of lies takes time that's why tammy's talking about this 24-hour rule usually what how that rule works is um if i tell you a lie or keep an important secret i have 24 hours to come clean uh, as long as i come clean to you within 24 hours you're not going to get mad at me about the delay you can still get mad at me about the secret or the, or the lie, but you're not going to get mad at me about the delay. If it takes me 25 hours to come clean, you can get mad about the delay too. Yeah. Um, so, so that it's a useful tool to help addicts come clean. Um, because again, a lot of times when it comes out of our mouth, we don't even realize it's a lie for a couple of hours or, you know, I mean, we get slowly get better at it, but I'm like, oh my God, I told her a lie yesterday at dinner. At breakfast today, I'm not going to come, you know, what I said last night at dinner was not true. I'm so sorry. Um, you know, I, I, this is a hard habit to break. I'm really working on it. The truth is this. Um, and that actually helps to build trust, by the way. Admitting that you lied helps to build trust or admitting that you kept, kept a secret helps to build trust because your, your betrayed partner can at least see your effort um, to, to make it right. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, it doesn't give you, I mean, it, it's not carte blanche to do more lies. It's just like, please learn that, I mean, like I, 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 lying is actually now one of those things that I really don't have tolerance for. I think because I've, you know, I mean, it's so important for me to be honest and transparent and things. So, so I have less tolerance for it. And, um, uh, you know, uh, anyway, it's a, that's a whole other topic. We're out of time. Keep joining us on sex and relationship healing dot com. Uh, uh, let's see. Today is Wednesday. So there's a betrayed partner group yet today at 1230 p.m. Pacific time. Scott will be on with Dr. David Fawcett at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So there's another webinar, more resources for you tomorrow and Friday. Every day there's stuff. So please check it out. Thanks, Scott, for joining me. I'll see you probably Thanks. the first week of December, too. Most likely. <laughs> Bye-bye.